thank you so much to Alex for coming in to do this. And um, you're in you're in in the, in the UK, and Alex Rose is in Chicago. I'm in Sydney, Australia, and is. <laughs> session time for me go ahead Alex. Go ahead. <laughs> that's yeah. right we've got we've got the time covered here <laughs> right, exactly so yeah thank you alex for joining us um i'm going to give everybody uh, a little a little version of your bio since there's a lot of cool stuff to mention so um dr alex mustard is from the uk um he's a marine biologist widely recognized as a leading underwater photographer he started underwater photography at age nine and has been a full-time professional for 15 years, shooting all around the world. He's especially noted for sharing his knowledge in his best-selling book, Underwater Photography Masterclass, and is the inventor of the magic filter for available light underwater imaging and has received national awards. Cool fact that you're going to need to tell us about. Uh, Alex Mustard has been made an MBE by Queen Elizabeth II in 2018, which is actually the same award that the Queen gave the Beatles in 1965. So this is going to be a cool story for us. <laughs> so um, a bit more. Uh, his images have won many prestigious awards, notably uh, over many years in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year contest, where his work is featured in 13 different portfolio books of winning photographs. In 2013, he was named overall winner for the European Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Alex is a founder and chair of the Underwater Photographer of the Year competition and has judged most major contests, including the Wildlife Photographer of the Year and the CMAS World Championship of Underwater Photography Awards. His teachings on underwater photography are published widely, and he currently writes two illustrated columns on underwater photography for scuba diving and for diver, currently at 84 editions, and has published more than 500 illustrated articles, with his photographs being used to illustrate many more times. He's a committee member of the British Society of Underwater Photographers, a recipient of the ADEX Award for Extraordinary Contribution to Underwater Photography, and just this year was awarded the Golden Trident from the International Academy of Underwater Sciences and Techniques. Woo! Going to need to get a drink of water after that one. I'm impressed. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking time to join us uh, today, Alex, and share with us some of your photos. So I will leave it to you. Oh, well, no, it's, it's real about your images. <laughs> um, and actually, I think these sessions are not just good for those tuning in. I think they're, they're good for all of us guys, keeping us sane when we're sitting alone in our houses. A little bit of human <laughs> contact beyond Very the Very true. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm obviously enjoying this tropical beach as the background. I know. I know. I'm so, I know, so it's jealous. beautiful. It, it's, yeah, you can see my hair waving in the, in the wind. <laughs> if but you sit you right behind go, the palm tree, it'll look like you can't go diving. It's not allowed. Yeah. That's what I was told. If I move too quickly, the background loses its tracking. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Funny. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, um, yeah, you've yeah, chosen so, 10 images-ish to show us, which I'm excited to see. Yes. Yeah. Um, M Michael's brief was to pick 10 images and talk about them. And I thought that would be Perfect. easiest if I picked images on a theme. And so since Michael was a, a judge this year of the wildlife photographer competition, and it's it's often at the place I see him most actually, because I don't get to many dive shows. So I tend to see him there at the award ceremony when he's when he's awarded or he's a judge or something, or I'm awarded in, 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 or whatever. So I thought that was a, a fun thing to talk about um, and talk about my competition images. Um, I used to enter all sorts of photography competitions, but over the last, sort of 15 years or so, I've generally focused on the, the major nature photography, wildlife photography competitions. The scale of those competitions, I think, has a real benefit for you as a photographer to get your work seen incredibly widely. And the Wildlife Photographer of the Year um, is really the pinnacle of, of that because those winning images just go absolutely everywhere. They're, you know, It's not an exaggeration to say that they're seen by hundreds of millions of people. And when you're, you know, you get excited, you know, sharing pictures on social media when they get, you know, 10, 20, 100 likes or whatever. But when your pictures start getting to that sort of audience, it's it's a real um, amazing thing. But it's also a fantastic opportunity for you as a photographer. So I wanted to show some of my favorite images, but talk a little bit about why I choose to enter them. And certainly when I first started entering photographic competitions, you know, my own, the only reason I was entering was to try and win, and I didn't really care how, how that came about, what picture it was. <laughs> but after you get a little bit of success, I think you, you want to choose quite carefully the types of pictures you put in, because particularly in a competition like the Wildlife Photographer, as soon as you've had one picture win there, you realize how famous that picture becomes, far more 
well known than you are. And you want the right picture to be in there. If you don't want to win with a picture that you're not happy with or a picture that you don't feel is offering something new amongst your peers. So that's kind of why I wanted to show some pictures and talk about why I chose to enter them. And obviously not everything I enter wins, um, but th those. I, I was also, I've got I've got the pictures in a slideshow. So I was going to open that up and yeah, just go. So you don't have to look at my head wobbling with the, the beach behind it. Um, <laughs> no worries at all. I'm, I'm going to go to screen share. So okay, um, just hopefully that should come up. It's just going to share my desktop. So, okay. um, oh, sorry. System preferences wants me just to allow um, Zoom to change. Sorry. Okay. Good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Take your time. Oh, no. Come on. Wait a sec. Uh -oh. um, Zoom doesn't want me to, won't let me share screen. Well, and let wait, you share directly until, the without restarting there you go. okay i think it's there happening you go. there you go there you go, there you go. Yeah, okay so um i'll just put this to play Perfect. so the, the first thing i actually put these pictures together just for a bit of fun um oh wow look at because that. they're treat. just some of the pictures from down the years of the wildlife photographer and to show how these competitions they give you experiences you could never dream of um, wow. the, the one on the left is, is um, um, David Duble, um, who's a good friend of Michael's. That was, that was last year, isn't it? That was last year. Yeah, and that's when we went to the, the Prime Minister's house um, back that in That was October. last year. Yeah, and that was just an incredible experience to go, you know. Then, and then there's other pictures there, um, me meeting meeting the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh from, from my country. And, and below, actually at one of the awards ceremonies, meeting um, the Duchess of Cambridge, um, better known as, as William's wife, Kate. Um, at one of the events um, there, and, and the other one is, is, is me collecting an award. But those are the sorts of opportunities you get. But as well as that, these great competitions can also open doors like being able to speak to school kids, you know, being able to go on, on, on mainstream media programs, news, um, interviews in magazines and newspapers. And it's as a photographer, it's an incredible platform to get your images known. So the message I most want to get out is, yes, we all want to win. But when these doors open, you want them to open with the right images for you. Um, pictures that you feel really represent what you're trying to do as a photographer, but also pictures that you're really deeply proud of. So for me, that's always a really you know, important point when I'm, I'm putting pictures in, is I'll think about the types of pictures that I was going to show. So to get onto some underwater pictures, um, this is the first picture that I had awarded in, in the wildlife photographer, the, the first picture I took that was awarded in the wildlife photographer. Um, this is a picture of a pair of, of shy hamlets spawning um, in the Caribbean, um, taken at sunset. Um, and this picture, this is probably, of all the pictures I've had awarded in the wildlife photographer, this is probably the one that was most calculated in terms of being a picture that I thought could do well. Um, back in, I took this picture, I think in 2003 or 2004, but I'd started working on the hamlets about three or four years before that. And I'd, when I was still working as a scientist, I'd read a scientific paper describing the spawning behavior. And, and hamlets are a fascinating species, and I, I'll try not to talk too long about them. But there's basically 10 different color types in the Caribbean. And those color types, when they actually look at the genetics of them, they're actually not, dis there's no genetic distinction between them. They, they're very much thought of by the scientists as being right in the middle of evolving into separate species. And the mechanism by which they're separating is when they spawn, they like to spawn with the same color type. And each time they do that, they take a step closer to being a separate species. And when they hybridize, they, they take a step back. And you know, no one's really sure whether they will end up as separate species or they'll end up mixed up again. But it's um, they're fascinating from that point of view. But they're also really interesting because they're one of the few vertebrate species that are true simultaneous hermaphrodites. We're quite used to a lot of coral reef fish changing sex during their lives. You know, a lot of wrasses and parrotfish, they, they, they start off as females and they become males. Um, anemone fish start off as males and become females. Um, you know, and that's quite common. But um, the hamlets actually remain active as male and female as adults. And so when they spawn, they have this weird spawning behavior where they spawn one way round as one acting as the male, one acting as the female, and then they stop. And then about a minute later, they spawn the other way around. And sometimes they swap two or three times during the night, um, during their spawning session. So they're really interesting to watch. And so I felt this was a really interesting story that I, I wanted to tell. 
Um, the scientists had already photographed them in the aquarium. So it's, I knew that there was a visually an interesting shot to get. Um, and that got me into to wanting to photograph this species. And having sort of built, I, I basically, I ended up by this shot by working out not only to capture the behavior and how to, how to see it, but I realized that to get my winning shot, I had to photograph the prettiest species. And I felt that the, the shy hamlet was the prettiest, had lovely yellow color to it. And then it was all about the pose. And you can't really control what pose you're gonna get when they're spawning. It just depends which way they face. But if you spend enough time with them, the angle where the male comes onto the camera because the male yawns when he's spawning and that angle was the one I wanted. So I, I, I kind of knew if, if I could get all this together, it was something fresh and new in underwater photography and it had a really good chance of being a competition success. And when I took this picture on the boat, I actually said to someone on the boat, I reckon I can win in the wildlife photographer with this shot. <laughs> like, I'm <half Nice>. joking. <laughs> you, you know he's and, a yeah, keeper and, straight and away. Like, yes. got it. Yeah, and yeah, and and I'd shot them lots before, um, but it was, yeah, it was just yeah, when I got this species. And it was actually quite logistically difficult for me to get because at that stage of my career, I didn't have very good contacts. I didn't know many people. And they spawn at dusk. And in the Cayman Islands where I was, they, they were hard to access at dusk because they're spawning out on the reefs. And most dive boats either dive during the day or they dive at night. And the only way I could go and dive with them was to find a dive operator that went out really early for night dives. And then they would let me jump in early before the night dive so that I could do this. And then, and so this was actually taken on like a, a standard tourist night dive. And I persuaded them to let me go in when they turned up on the dive site to do their long briefing about how to night dive. And I popped in early and got this shot. So, you know, obviously these days I have better contacts to be able to get more <laughs> access. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the, what I was going to run through. I'll maybe not speak quite so long about the others. Um, okay. That's really cool though. Shopping. I love that. That's a great story. Wow. Okay. Oh. So this photo is kind of where that type of photography has gone. Um, this is a photo that I took in 2018. And I, I took this, this picture won the underwater category in the biggest Spanish nature photography competition last year, the Mont Photo Contest, um, which is a, a really, really, it's kind of like the, the Spanish version of, of the wildlife photography I've been running a long time and has a, a lot of the same photographers doing well in it. The Spanish photographers tend to dominate very strongly anyway in the wildlife photographer. Um, and this picture here, I I really wanted to show this, show this picture because for me, it's an, an amazing image that I took. It involved a huge amount of luck to get this particular shot. I was photographing these um, surgeon fish. They're yellow-tailed surgeon fish. They're endemic to the Red Sea. And I photographed them courting. And I was never really intending to get a spawning shot of them because when they spawn, they swim as fast as they can up from the reef and split apart. And I never ever thought I'd get a shot of it. And this shot was a complete fluke. I, I was trying to get this shot, but they just happened to swim into focus right at the moment they, that they, they were spawning. And what I'd never realized before getting this shot is actually when they spawn, they flip over and they, they go belly to belly. And they just happen, and I just happened to get them. And this picture isn't a long exposure. It's just the fish are swimming so fast that there's all this blur around them. <laughs> I think the picture is like a 60th of a second, but the fish were just going so far. So it's a, I, it's a photo that, you know, owes a lot to luck as a lot of competition shots do. But I know it's it's unique, and I know this picture will be unique for the rest of my life. I'll never take another one like it. No one else, I'm sure, mm -hmm. will. Um, just because it's just complete, you know, they just happen to be in focus, and I happen to press the shutter, not ever expecting to get it. Um, right. Um, yeah, this actually was. I took this one on when I was running a Red Sea workshop, and I'd um, organized. We'd gone to a place that was really, really good for shooting split level shots at sunset. And, and all the group were doing that. And I'd been to that place like, you know, 20 times to shoot sunset shots. And I was like, right, I'm going to go and do something else because I can't <laughs> I'm done face photographing the same corals <laughs> again with the same sunset. There's no clouds in the red sea. The sunset's the same every night. So I went and, and did this just, just diving on like a rubbly reef underneath the mooring of the boats um, in, um, near, near, near Shamash and, and photograph these. So, yeah, right. Um, next picture. I think one of the things that when we have success in competitions, 
um, as photographers, we like to sort of analyze and understand why those pictures were successful. And certainly something that comes up a lot in, in some of my um, awarded shots in these major competitions is that those shots have some sort of technical novelty to them, um, either in terms of using new equipment that's just coming out and enabling me to take new types of pictures or me trying to, to take um, different styles of shots that are kind of pushing boundaries. And these next few images all have something new in terms of the equipment I was using for them that just made that shot a little bit special. Now, I think one thing that's really important to be clear about is the judges couldn't care less what camera you took the picture with, as long as the quality is good enough. And they, in none of these situations, would the judges have been aware that the picture was taken with any sort of new technology. Um, the pictures are appealing to them because that use of that new technology has enabled me to take a picture that just moves the game on in that style of shot a little bit. And, and this picture here is a, you know, a relatively simple idea. It's a, a silhouette shot of, of, a, of a whale shark, but it's the detail of this shot that I think makes it really stand out in that everything was, was absolutely, absolutely right. Um, this is a, a young whale shark in, in Isla Mujeres in Mexico. Um, and it was photographed, um, taken as a silhouette early one morning. And, and the main thing that I wanted to achieve with this shot was, was to get this lovely silhouette. But the key thing was to wait to get a whale shark coming in exactly the direction I wanted. So I found the angle where the sun was right at the base of Snell's window. It was early in the morning, lovely calm morning, so really nice sun rays, the wind hadn't got up. Um, but I really went, wanted to wait for a shark to be coming exactly out of the sun to get this, this, this light effect. And the only way I could do that really was once I saw a shark was swimming like mad to get in position so that the shark would come directly out of the sun. So that all the, the perfection of the sunbeams being exactly symmetrical around the shark. The, obviously there's a lot of symmetry in, in the body shape of the shark. Those things I think really add to the graphic strength of this image. And the piece of equipment that really made a difference for me in this case was using a, a, a really small camera. Um, a lot of the times as underwater photographers, as we get better and better underwater photography, our cameras get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And um, the, the year I took this, which was, this was taken in 2012, um, the, the first Micro Four Thirds mirrorless cameras had come out that were really good. And this was taken with what was then the, the best Micro Four Thirds mirrorless camera, um, an Olympus OMD EM5, which was, um, I think a lot of underwater photographers, it really made them embrace mirrorless and particularly Micro Four Thirds shooting. Definitely. And it meant that I had a really high quality camera that was really small. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure Michael remembers the days when you know, as a as a shooting film, we could grab a, a Nikonos 5 and have a really small little camera that was really high quality. Um, and at times that was the right tool for the job. And we've never really had that in, in, in the digital era, but actually these cameras, that's what I was using this camera for. So I had this really small camera that meant I was really maneuverable in the water. I could really get myself in exactly the position I wanted to. And the camera had enough image quality to be able to capture the shot. So that was a really important aspect to me being able to get exactly the composition I wanted for, the, for this shot. I love the water movement in front of its yeah. face too. That's such a yeah. cool detail. It's just, yeah, it's beautiful. Can I ask, is this a, a converted from black and white or is this, is this color and just this, just the time of the morning is very little color? Uh, no, it, it's black and white and it was awarded in black and white category Okay. Um, at the Wildlife Photographer. And so, yeah, it's a black one. I actually prefer this picture as a color shot um, oh. in many ways, um, although it's better known as a black and white shot. It's, it, it's actually one of those nice ones. That quite often you find with the competition shots, they're not necessarily your most commercial shots. They don't tend to sell very well for editorial um, usage. Um, they, you know, they certainly, you know, the fish spawning stuff, you know, no one, hardly anyone ever buys that. But the color version of this does very well as a selling shot. But the black oh. and white version never sells. Um, and I love that little right. remora off to the side. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, it's those funny of, yeah, little I, details, I, you know. Uh. Yeah, and that's certainly something like of the wildlife photographer when they print up the the big prints for the main exhibition. That you know, hundreds of thousands of people go and visit almost mm -hmm. every week. It's 
hugely popular, the, 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 the London version. Yeah. And, I mean, it travels around the world too. Mm-hmm. People really, really, you know, spend time with the images and really look into the details. And, you know, it, it's one of the lessons is you can get away with, as a photographer, with really small subjects in the frame and the pictures can still work really well. But also everyone really sees all the details in your shot. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's very much in that sense. Um, this next one is also from the wildlife photographer. Oh, yes. I love this one. I love this. I remember yeah. the shot. This, yeah, this, and this, this is quite recent, wasn't it? This is quite recent. Yeah, it was about, um, yeah, it was about, uh, yeah, I don't remember the year, but yeah, I, I took this picture in 2015. So I guess it was awarded right. 2016 because I, I took this picture on the trip where when I, I my wife found out she was pregnant um oh. at home so, and my daughter was born in in 2016 so um, right. oh, and, cool. I, and yeah, so I, I always remember the trip for that reason yeah um and, and this is one where i'd this was just taken using a, a special optic for for the wide angle lens that allowed me to shoot my rectilinear lens my wide angle lens um at a wider aperture than normal which in a very dark environment underneath the wreck um not underneath the wreck. this is so, so this picture to go back to the beginning is a, a picture of a cormorant hunting um, Pacific chub mackerel, which are aggregated under an oil rig off, off, off Los Angeles. And the, there's, there's a couple of rigs out off, 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 off LA where they allow you to dive under them you know, with permission. And it's a really, really amazing diving experience. You know, when it's swelling and the current's running and you know, it's quite an intimidating place to dive because you're really in the middle of the ocean. And when you get near the edges of the, the rig, the current really feel, you know, starts to pull and you know yeah I was wearing a dry suit so you're not as fast in the water as when you're wearing a wetsuit and everything like that but it was a fascinating environment the legs are covered in in life and color and then there's all sorts of pelagic stuff going on there the fish aggregate there because they're actually protected from fishing because you can't fish around the rigs so it's a really interesting ecosystem um and I wanted to tell that story of the, the natural history story of the, the cormorant hunting, but also have the rig as part of the picture, not just make it about, you know, fish and, and a cormorant, which we'd seen lots of times before. And this is an example of, of also being aware that the subject doesn't necessarily need to be really big in the frame for the picture to work. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's a lesson that the generation who's used to showing people pictures on phones is very want always wants the subject to be as big as possible in the picture. Right. And actually, you know, people don't always look at pictures tiny on a phone. They often see them big. And those pictures that work very well when they're seen small like that often become a bit boring when they're bigger and a picture yeah. with a bit more space, a bit more to in- enjoy. So I think those are some of the reasons this picture was was successful. Um, and this picture almost almost um won the category the, the judges told me they were split on, on the on the judge on the judging. Oh. Um, but, it, but in those days you just it's just a um but anyway it's not 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 a big deal for me um, <laughs> for me my my goal in in that contest is is to be awarded as, as often as possible as opposed to to always you know i'm very happy just to to regularly feature and be sort of part of the right. scenery there rather yeah, than that be makes a sense. Big winner. and then yeah. you have to you have a very stressful award ceremony at the wildlife photographer if you're a category winner <laughs> because you might be the overall winner can't get too drunk whereas i could <laughs> <be too> much- <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> Good one. <laughs> the key technical thing on this was I wanted the legs of the, I'd shot this already with a fisheye and had a really nice fisheye shot, but the bendy legs were an issue, the, the legs of the mm-hmm. um, of the aura rig. And yeah. so I decided to go and shoot it with a rectilinear wide angle lens, but because it was so dark underwater, I wanted to keep the detail into the corners because I knew the fish were going into the corners of the frame. And I'd mm-hmm. been, I'd actually personally been, had, had developed or had, I don't know, it's not quite the right word. I'd adopted this old um, underwater optic made by Carl Zeiss for Hasselblad. And I'd um, re- sort of re-engineered it to be able to use it on my SLR. And so this was a really nice sort of reward for me for all that hard work of trying to get this, this lens to work. And, and I'd done a lot of testing to, to get it all set up right and everything like that. And then this was a really great opportunity to use it when if I'd had to shoot this with a dome port, it would have been really hard to get those corners sharp in the right. amount of light that was down there and huh. because it was so dark underneath the rig. So so the technology allowed, and I think, you know, you know, five years ago, the camera's ISOs wouldn't have been able to deal with this. The optics wouldn't have been able to deal with it. And right. so that's why I shot like this and sort of been undiscovered 
Um, and in five years' time, it'd be relatively easy with camera technology for people to take a shot like this. So right. it was kind of right. the technology allowed me to create a fresher image at, at that time. Very right. neat. And um, ah. this picture here is, 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 is one that's in the current exhibition at the Wildlife Photographer. Yep, it um, is. And it's I'm a just, relatively it's, it's, it's right now in Sydney image. at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, and right, yeah. you probably saw it when you were in, in the museum doing the judging this yes. year as well. Yes. And it, it's a picture that, you know, on a phone looks, yeah, nice. But <laughs> the bigger it gets, the really the better it gets because it's it's packed with really interesting detail. Just the way the light from the strobes and, and particularly from the sun is just reflecting on the different fish. Um, this picture is, um, has sold so many prints, the museum told me. Because huh. people just love it, you know. I think black and white pictures people often feel a, a bit better for their walls than than color pictures. And the, right. the museum sells prints from the exhibition, and I think particularly when you see it really printed, really big, it, it really really works. And this was taken when I was working with with Naughty Cam on their new wide angle corrector port, which is a, another wide angle optic, and I was doing some late testing on a pre-production unit. It was the final design, but it wasn't a commercial unit yet. And I, I took it on, on um, to the Red Sea to do some shooting with it. Um, mm -hmm. And this was taken with that. So it's also really nice when you work with manufacturers to help create a new piece of equipment and you're able to, to have some success with it. You know, obviously the judges would have no idea about that. They were just reacting to the image as a visual image. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact that I had that sort of new technology on my side allowed me to produce mm -hmm. a picture like this with that. A better image quality, you know, slightly, you know, good, you know, good sharpness right to the edges of the frame, you know, real detail in, in the picture. And I think those those factors may, maybe help a little bit. And the same is true of the next one. This is um, um, an Embrotha um, nudibranch. And, and this is a, a, you know, for me, a very standard shot. But this was um, awarded in the wildlife photography for probably five, five, six years ago. And this picture was used a huge amount in, in like their, their publicity. It was on banners all around the world. It was on invitations. It was on, you know, it was just used again and again and again. And these days I, I probably wouldn't show it in a normal talk. You know, it's, it's a nice shot. It's a well-known shot, but it's, you know, lots of underwater photographers have similar, very similar nudibranch shots. But at the time I took this, um, I think it was still relatively fresh. And that's because the explosion in super macro capabilities in underwater photography hadn't really happened yet because the gear that we now all consider you know you know it's in everyone's gear bag hadn't come out and this was taken with a prototype of what became naughty cams smc close-up lens which was one of the sharpest high resolution options out there and obviously in the wildlife photographer they check all the raw files so well lots of people have a shot like this you know this is shot like this but um you know it's not cropped or, or adjusted uh, no at all so the raw file looks exactly like this and i think i was able to get that and get the really great image quality right out into the corners of the frame on the rhinophores because of the new 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 new, new equipment and i think that enabled this shot although i think from an underwater perspective is nothing super special i think it really appealed to those judges and the other point i wanted to make with this shot was to say that with a competition like the wildlife photographer, some years, as this year, you had an underwater judge on the panel, but quite often they don't have an underwater judge on the panel. So yeah. there's room to enter pictures that maybe if you had a bunch of underwater photographers, they'd say, oh yeah, we've seen that type of thing before. I think when you have a, a bunch of non-underwater photographers, you know, they don't know what's rare, what's common right. necessarily that well. So, you know, you, you want to base it more around visual appeal. And for yeah. me, I was thrilled to be able to tell the story of nudibranchs to that audience, you know, yeah. and, you know, the caption we, we did for this one was all about, you know, how nudibranchs are what they eat and, you know, nembrothers, mm. they eat um, sea squirts, they get toxins from the sea squirts, they secrete them into the pustules around their body. They have these bright poster colors to advertise the fact that mm -hmm. they're distasteful. You know, the contrast between the orange and the green is a big part of how it's able to survive. And actually the orange pigments in these are fluorescent. So you don't need a flash gun to see them at depth. If you photograph one of these in available light, you still see the orange because the orange is actually a fluorescent pigment. So it's generating that right. orange at depth. So um, all those factors kind of, it was really nice to be able to tell Yes, it's a slug, 
but there's a lot more to it than that and it's it's, it's not it's always a, it has to be about the big animal right right where That's am i great. um right number seven um and this oh. is uh, another oh, yeah. no, this is an older picture of mine from the wildlife photographer that is um probably the, the best known one of, of mine from the wildlife photographer partly because it's one of the older ones but it was also a really really well promoted one in the year that it won um it really you know it was in all the press and it was you know used as an exhibition banner poster everywhere as well yeah um and and this picture i think is is one of the ones most dear to my heart because i think i, I felt that it was a story i think this is the one that really cemented to me how important it is to have the pictures you want in the competition it's not just about mm. this has got the best chance of winning it's actually this is the story i wanted to tell um, and th this is a picture taken in, in Egypt. Um, this is a boha snapper. So this is a large predatory reef fish. You find them right across the Indo-Pacific. And they're usually solitary hunters, but they gather um, periodically in some places once or once a month, some places twice a month, in other places just once or twice a year. They gather in large numbers to spawn. And this is a spawning aggregation in, in the Red Sea. Um, and particularly in Palau, actually, you can see them spawning. In, in the Red Sea, they tend to spawn at night, and the area that they, they, they gather in is a marine park that doesn't allow diving at night, so you can't see them spawn there. But you can still see these amazing aggregations of fish, and it was a story I really wanted to tell. And it was a chance to sort of to highlight a conservation issue with both a bit of carrot and a bit of stick, in that <laughs> the Egyptians were doing a reasonable job of protecting this spawning aggregation. You know, there's a national park set up around them, but they weren't really policing the fishing that well. And so this was a great chance to tell the story of how important this spawning aggregation is for the, the future to say, well done, Egypt, for setting up a marine park, but also to get the message out there that it's not always a perfect park and you need to, to, to do a better job with it. And actually, in recent years, the Egyptians now actually pay their fishermen to stay in port during the spawning season. Ah, so great. the fishermen are paid oh. to stay in port, not go out and fish. Um, whereas <laughs> um, for about five or six years after I took this picture, they were still still going out there. Uh -huh. um, the reason I feel that this picture did well is it offered a really, really fresh perspective um, on as, as an underwater picture. And uh, uh, this was a picture taken in the very early days of digital photography. I shot this with a, a D100 camera. Um, so sort of right back at the beginning of, 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 dig, of decent digital cameras. And it was a picture where I realized what I could do on, di where I was trying to exploit what was possible on digital that we couldn't do on film. And one of the problems you would have on film is if you shot a subject too far away, it was blue and it stayed blue forever. And <laughs> what I was, what I became aware of, you know, early in digital is that, yes, okay, we didn't have things like Lightroom, so you you had you, you couldn't actually fix your white balance perfectly in post, um, but you could tune the white balance in the camera so that your pictures were great, you know, um, in, in, you know, look look good out of the camera. So mm -hmm. I set up this shot with my flash guns pushed probably about two feet, you know, um, sixty seven centimeters in front of my lens, wow. so that I could get light on this subject while shooting it from a relative distance. It was a okay. technique sort of I later, you know, shared and called telephoto photography. But at the time, I was just trying to solve the problem of lighting a subject that was relatively far away. Um, and it's shot very much like someone might photograph a bird or something on land with a telephoto lens, mm -hmm. forcing the perspective, putting the background out of focus, but also kind of pulling it closer. Right. And I think that this picture appealed to the judges. You know, it's got great character in the individual fish but it's the background that makes the picture. And it's a very unusual perspective for an for a underwater picture. And I think it, it's one of the, it's, it also gets used a lot in a lot of the collection books that the, the wildlife photographer publishes, which is a great measure that the picture has aged well, that they still want to keep using it and putting it out there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that came, and I think and it, it, the lesson for me from this was that if you can, you know, if you are able to push, break some ground technologically, you can have an, a, an awarded picture, even with what is basically a not rare, not particularly charismatic subject. But if you can make it so in your picture, it can really stand out. So that's kind of what I learned from this one. That's right. a great one. Um, the last couple. 
Um, this is, yes, yeah, so I've, I've got um, two or three left. Um, this picture is a coral spawning shot um, taken in the Caribbean. And this was awarded in the, the European Wildlife Photographer Competition, which is, it's, it's a competition, it's kind of the, the German version of, of the wildlife photographer. Uh, it's called the GDT, European Wildlife Photographer of the Year. And it's open only to European photographers or people who join their society. Um, so it doesn't have as big an entry as the wildlife photographer, but actually it has a huge overlap with the winners from the wildlife photographer because the two competitions run at the same time. A lot of the photographers choose to enter the same pictures in both competitions at the same time. And a lot of the category winners from the wildlife photographer last year were category winners in, in the GDT this, this year, last year as well. Um, so personally though, I don't do that. And I, I often feel I'm one of the few photographers who, who takes this approach. I don't sort of agree with spamming competitions with my pictures. I have a rule that I've always adhered to that once a picture has won a competition, even if it's a highly commended in a relatively minor competition, I won't enter it anywhere else. It's, it's retired from competitions at that point. Um, and the reason I do that is I, I, I think it's, for me, it's, I, I want my photography, I want to be known as a photographer who can shoot lots of different subjects, wide angle, macro, cold water, tropical, creative, natural history, behavior. Um, I want to be known to, to have that, to have that width of ability, not just be a photographer who wins lots of prizes with basically the same shot or similar shots. Right. The same. Um, so I've always sort of, you know, once something's won, it's retired. And this is a picture that I'd really sort of almost kind of regret that I put it in GDT because it's not, I, I think I wished I'd have saved it for the wildlife photographer. <laughs> um, just because I, 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 it's one of my favorite pictures because I think it's, for me, it's one of the purest wildlife photography shots that I, I've done um, in terms of, I actually worked out when these corals would spawn. I, I did those calculations back in 2003 when I was working as a scientist. Um, and we actually, and actually did the, the first ever observations of mass coral spawning in, in the Cayman Islands, where I did the calculations mm -hmm. for. Um, and then took some pictures and then over the years and then went back, I think in 2012, maybe 2013 to take this shot, um, where I used my own calculations to predict the spawning of the, the thing and then went down and set up a remote strobe, waited for the coral to be about to spawn and then was able to create this you know, fairly unique backlit coral spawning picture. Um, and I think I poured so much of myself into this shot using an unusual technique, using you know, you know, calculations to figure things out. Right. That, you know, I, I kind of, the GDT is, is, a, is I think the competition that the, a lot of the photographers look at first because it's often artistically a little bit more breaking new ground than the wildlife photographer, but the wildlife okay. photographer gets more international press coverage. So right. I, and I kind of, I'd have loved to have told this story to an even bigger audience, just because I'm so proud of this particular shot. Yeah. Um, but that... maybe visually it takes a bit of getting, because it's, it's kind of, it is, it's a mess. But it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a mess. it's a lovely picture, it's a great storytelling, and it's, 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 it's the moment. And, and I think it's, it's a lot of planning going to getting this shot. It's not easy. Oh yeah. You've seen so many spawning pictures, but it's the one of the best I've ever seen. Yeah, no, I, I'm really, you know, I'm really, you know, proud of these shots and it's yeah so I'd, I'd love to actually do more of this and i'd, I'd yeah um you know, I know it's not doing particularly well at the moment the the, the great barrier reef but i'd yeah. i'd love to 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 visit there and shoot spawning i just never had the chance um to, to do that, that would be great yeah it's almost like it's on land you know? it's like a storm <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a little bit like it's like a starry sky or, yes. or something like that. It's, yeah, it's, it um, does, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mountain of star coal. Um, yep, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, that's so, cool. Um, Love that. Right. Very neat. And then the last couple are just a couple of shots. This was actually awarded the same year as the coral in GDT um, and taken um, maybe in this, on the same trip as well. I don't mm. remember. And this is um, a, a hunting predation shot. Um, taken of these bar jacks hunting silver sides um, and just made that little bit more interesting than than normal by the use of a long exposure which uh -huh. you can see at the top of the frame it's turned the um, the silver sides into spaghetti um, <laughs> yeah. and I think that's 
that's quite, and, you know, I, I just, I, I like that movement and that effect. And I've, I've done a, a lot of similar shots like this, but this was, this was a, I really like those three fish and just the whole balance of the, the composition. Mm -hmm. But I think it's that little twist of using a long exposure that probably made this a little bit more, have a little stronger visual appeal and probably stand out from other shots of similar subject matter that I'm sure would have been in the contest um, from other photographers. So yeah. it, it, you don't always necessarily, uh, when you're trying to be creative and, and create these images that stand out from other people, you don't need to completely reinvent the wheel. It's often just a case of, you know, just pumping the tires up a little bit more, maybe having slightly <laughs> better tires than someone else. You know, it's just those little differences that can often make people stand out. And that's why I think with some of the, the technology I've used down the years, you know, when new stuff comes along, using that to take pictures that, you know, maybe take a small step forward in that area um, or using techniques that just give your work a, just a slight differentiation from, from others. And often the judges won't necessarily say it's because of that. They'll just say, I love it and it feels <laughs> fresh. Therefore, we want yep. to award it. It's not always such a thing. And then the, the final shot is, oh, is yeah. this, oh, this yeah. photo. Um, that one's amazing. The, yeah, it was the, the overall winner from, from the GDT, European Wildlife Photography. Makes yeah, sense. <laughs> in 2013. And yeah. it's, it's a picture that I don't think has ever sold. You know, it's not commercially got any value at all. Um, I oh, don't show it often in slideshows because it takes too long to explain what it is. So Amazing. it's not normally a picture that I get much use out of. Too bad. Um, but it was, <laughs> a, I think it was a picture that I took. I was driven to take it not because I was trying to take a competition shot, but I was driven by a curiosity to experiment with the techniques and trying mm -hmm. to make them work. And, and the, the photo is of a sponge on a coral reef with, um, with and I put um, light behind it. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's a long exposure of that scene as fish came in to hunt. The light attracted yeah. zooplankton, yeah. the zooplankton attracted small bait fish, and then the bait fish attracted jacks. And it's the trails yeah, of the fabulous. That you generally see in the picture. So um, how long up, exposure was this? I think this one, I can't, I should have looked it up. I think it was an eight second one, this one. Okay. But I, I yeah. On that evening, I was just experimenting and playing. Very oh, cool. And I was very limited because um, I went to a, a, a shallow patch reef to do this right. so that I could find reefs surrounded by sand um, where I could put the tripod. Exactly. Um, and the problem with that dive site was that actually the sponges there or the topography was very unattractive. And there were mm. some quite nice wavy sea fans, but they were blurring too much in my, my photos. Uh, so nice. the only thing I had was this very boring gray spot as a sort of <laughs> foreground. And I always really was frustrated by that at the time. And I didn't think I was getting, I was interested by what I was getting, but I kind of thought this was a stepping stone towards a better shot. Yeah. But I was trying to figure out how I could find a better foreground without in a place where I could put a tripod down. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and That's I think, so you know, and this is a picture that I, I would say from a competition point of view, you could enter this in 10 competitions and nine times out of 10, it would go out in the first round. <laughs> and I think, that's something you could say with a lot of pictures that do, you know, that, that end up being overall winners. They can be real opinion splitters that, and I think often pictures that can go all the way in competitions almost need to be a little bit like that sometimes in that they've got to be something that people are either going to fall totally in love mm -hmm. with or just go, oh my God, not at all. And I understand that. And actually after I took this picture, I didn't enter it in the competition for a couple of years. Really? I took, this, I took this in January 2012 and it was awarded okay. in 2013 October. And the, huh. the reason was I came back from the trip and I sent the picture to um, a, a photo editor who's a, who's a good friend, of, a good friend of mine, you know, work, she worked for a magazine yeah. uh, I was working with. And I said, you know, here are some of my latest pictures. What do you think? And I was like, I'm really excited by this. And she was like, no, not at all. Cause she was very much thinking uh -huh. with an editorial hat on going, you know, I can't use that picture for anything. And I kind of, it kind of made me lose my confidence in it a bit. So I didn't oh. enter it for a while and then entered it the following year. Um, but probably, you know, a, a, another year, a different set of judges, it wouldn't have got anything anyway. So it was all serendip serendipitous um, huh. for the success. But I, I really like it because I think when you do win big, 
in a competition, whether it's, you know, getting your first wildlife photographer thing, you want it to be with the right shot. And mm -hmm. what I was really proud about this shot, and it won really big for me was that I'd never seen another underwater photo like it. Yep. Um, it felt like I'd done something that was really, really original and different. Absolutely. So when it did get all the praise and, and all the publicity to it, uh, you know, it's not like I'd won with, you know, a version of a, a, of a picture of a, of, a, of a clownfish that everyone's got <laughs> and they just happened to like it that year. I, I'd right. won with something that was, you know, only I'd done this shot at, at that time and it yep. felt really fresh. I hadn't really shared it much on social media because I didn't have a lot of confidence in it. And then once I knew it had won, I obviously kept it very much under wraps for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it did come out, it felt really fresh. And I think that's something that I, I would take away from the contest is, is there's nothing better than winning with a picture that people have never seen. You know, when I, I remember when that's the, true. you know, you know, so when you get these shots, you know, yes, you can spam them in, or you can, sorry, it's the wrong word, but you can put them in every <laughs> competition out there. And, and you know pick up loads of prizes but there's nothing better than winning really big with a shot that mm -hmm. no one has seen before and you're just like bang there it is it's even, yeah. it's even, even better anyway that's my 10 i've talked for ages oh, well. so. <laughs> That, that I could is, listen forever, yeah, though. Yeah. These are such great stories. So your, your, your work is uh, very inspiring and, and, and obviously a lot of uh, thoughts go into it, a lot of planning and, and, and a lot of time to get those, those pictures. Um, you have uh, won the, the WPY many times, have judged it before. What will be your, your, your uh, 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 message and or your advice to, to, to participants in, in this competition? I think the, the most, I'm going to get myself back to being my screen rather than my, there we go. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think I, I, I would say the most important thing with any contest is to be in it. You know, there's no point sitting at home when the results come out going, I've got a better shot than that. You know, <laughs> I, I, I should have been, you know, if you want to have success in the competitions, you need to be in them, you know, in, in all of them. So, you know, don't sit around, you know, you know, if you, you know you've got to be in them. And yes, you're not going to win every time. And I think, the, first, the most important advice is to not take it too seriously. So I take the photography really seriously. And I do put a lot of thought into what I want to enter for some of the reasons that I've said. But at the same time, I never take the results too seriously. When I don't win, it doesn't mean I've suddenly become a bad photographer. If it's, you know, three or four years and I haven't won anything in the wildlife photography, it doesn't mean, you know, my, my, my photography's suddenly got awful. <laughs> It just means that, you know, maybe the judges are looking for different things that time. And I think I'd say that to anyone is, you know, you know, you can't judge. Photography can only be judged subjectively. And as a result, you should never put too much weight on the results and get yourself all wound up if you don't win. And if you do win, if you've got good stuff and you enter regularly, you'll get your rewards over time. Um, it won't always be with the, the shots that you think are most deserving. And I could just as easily do another top 10 talk of the pictures that I've entered in the wildlife photographer that I thought should win um, and still objectively now feel are stronger than some of the ones that have won. Um, and I think every photographer who gets awarded pictures can, would say the same thing. Um, yeah. but I think you've got to be in it to win it. You've got to put your best pictures in, um, but don't take the results too personally. You know, <laughs> the judges are trying to do the best job they can, but then, you know, they, they, you know, then, then, you know, they're going to react to each other. I think all you can ask of the competition is that the judges, gave it proper consideration you know as you know they, yeah. they thought about the pictures they, they looked at them properly they had a you know good good thought and that's and then you accept the results and and you and you and you move on yeah but i mean you have yeah. judged uh, a few times a couple have you judged a couple of times before right alex I, i've judged the wildlife dog for once and right. i actually after I, I judged it the last time i actually said i i don't want to judge it too regularly because I'd rather enter it. I think I have more to <laughs> benefit from, from being an entrant at this stage of my career than being a judge. So it's nice to judge and it's... Um, it it takes know, a lot um, of time, a lot of time and hours looking at pictures and, and, and you know, there's so many good pictures and, and it's very, it's very yeah. hard. Absolutely. And you, as you'll find when you, you go back to the awards ceremony as a, um, in, in, in October as a judge this year, Michael, it's... It's fun to go to the event, but mm. the collection, which at the moment is your collection, you know, you know, these pictures, you've debated uh -huh. them. No one else knows them. Suddenly 
it becomes the public's thing and the night is about the photographers it's not about you guys as judges and suddenly you're kind of you feel a little bit like kind of a um a spare person on a date you know you're like it's a party but it's not a party for me anymore um i mean it, it's, it's not funny. quite that but it's and it's so i you know i'm really proud to have judged it i you know i would love to judge it again in the future and, and particularly because i'm based in the uk i'm sure that there's a good chance they'll ask me but um I wouldn't want to judge it regularly because I think actually as a photographer, there's more to be gained from, from being in it, even if you mm. don't win regularly than being a judge. Yeah. Makes uh, sense. Alex, is there any questions? Any, any questions out there? Fine. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, I don't know. Hold on. Let me look. Not, not on ours, not on Zoom. We don't Zoom. have a lot of time, but I'm sure we can take one or two, one or two questions if there's any, because uh, we have took a lot of time. I just want to say it's been so nice got, to. He has got this. Uh, I yeah. know, I know. I'll look, I'll look. I'm checking. Um, but no, it, it's so nice to listen to uh, stories behind photos when they come from uh, people that have a science background. Because I think so often in the photography world, it's it's people from an art perspective or an aesthetic perspective, which does add a certain different quality to a photo. But when it's coming from someone with a science background, um, there's always this different level of comprehension of what's going on in the picture. And I always love hearing those kind of stories involved. So thanks for sharing. Um, no, no just checking uh, if we've got any questions on Facebook. <laughs> well, it's been working, so that's good. <laughs> oh, well, it's working. It's fine. Yeah, that's yeah it's good. been working. No problem. Well, that's good. All right. It's mostly uh, people just saying they're really enjoying these stories. So thanks. <laughs> okay, Everything's good. working. Yeah, so interesting. Session data on Yeah. No, no specific questions, mostly just comments about enjoying it very much. <laughs> so thank you. Once again, All right. Alex, thank you so much for, for spending time with us. Really enjoy it and we hope to see you again. Thank yeah, you very thanks much. Thanks for joining yeah, us. I'm, I'm back to childcare now. My wife's was supposed to be working by now, so. Oh, shoot. Happy Sorry. <laughs> it's the way the, the way the day goes here. She works for a bit, I work for a bit. And Fair. everyone who's not working is dealing with a little monster. <laughs> All right, good luck, and Sounds we hope good. to see you in the water somewhere soon. Ciao. Absolutely. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.